Okay, so now Christian will tell us about how to strengthen the security of ACP. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, this uh, paper is called Strengthening Access Control Encryption, and it's a uh, joint work with. Uh, Christian Baracha and uh, Uri Maura. And yeah, so the other Christian is also here in the audience. If you want to talk, you can talk to uh, both of us. Okay, so uh, yeah, as was uh, introduced in the previous talk, access control. Microphone! Oh, excuse me. Okay, so, sorry. So, so uh, yeah, as, as was uh, introduced in the previous uh, talk, access control encryption is a rather new uh, primitive which was introduced by Damgard, Haag, and Orlandi uh, last year. And so syntactically, it just consists of these uh, five algorithms. And um, so there's a setup that gets some predicate that basically specifies uh, who is allowed to send information to whom. <coughs> and given such a predicate, you then generate a, a master secret key and some sanitizer parameters. And then with the master secret key, you can generate uh, sender and receiver keys the sender keys you can encrypt, and with the receiver keys you can decrypt, but uh, yes, you don't decrypt directly, but the ciphertext first goes through the sanitization, which gets the ciphertext and the sanitizer key, and then you have a sanitized ciphertext, which is then decrypted. And the basic idea is that um, if the, this, this the policy predicate allows to, uh, to decrypt, then you should get the message, and otherwise you shouldn't. So that's the the basic idea of, of X control encryption. And so we thought about whether you can actually use this in, in practice, whether the existing security notion is uh, strong enough to achieve something meaningful. So to, to understand this, we first have to think about how one would actually use this. So a yeah, natural use case uh, is as follows. So here it's a simple example. On the left and the right, we have two users. In practice, there would be many more. Then we have two special roles. At the top, the guy uh, with the trusted authority to generate the, the keys. And at the bottom, we have the sanitizer. Now, basically, what you do at the beginning, this trusted authority specifies a policy and then generates using the setup algorithm the keys. And then basically, he needs to send the sanitizer key to the sanitizer. And to do this, we kind of need an authenticated channel, which means that no one can change this, this, authentic, this, this sanitizer key. Right? And then the, uh, the trusted authority can also generate uh, sender and receiver keys, and they need to be sent to the corresponding users. And this needs to be done over secure channels, which here means that it's not only authenticated, but also confidential. And it's also clear that we need this because we don't want uh, bad guys to get uh, additional keys. Okay, so in this example, the left guy uh, gets a sender key for this uh, role R, and uh, we can give the right guy a receiver role, a uh, receiver key for the role R prime. It's just an example. And now the guy on the left can encrypt the message and basically send the ciphertext to the sanitizer, who sanitizes the ciphertext and then writes it into the repository. And as was pointed out in the previous talk, it's really important that this goes uh, through the sanitizer, so we cannot allow the, the sender to directly put the ciphertext in the repository. Uh, so this is also why there's this pencil at the bottom. This is uh, supposed to show that only the sanitizer can write to the repository. Uh, because if, if we allow anyone to, to write in the repository, then just someone can send a plain text in a repository and everyone can see it. And we want to disallow people who are not allowed by the policy to write to do that. Now that's why everything needs to go through the sanitizer. Okay, but if the guy on the right is now allowed to read, then he can basically just get the ciphertext from the repository, decrypt, and get back the message. So this, this is the, the basic idea of how one would use an ACE scheme in practice. And now for security, we need to think about uh, what the assumption here is, right? So who is uh, supposed to be honest or, or dishonest, and kind of what, what is clear that the, the guy at the top, this trusted authority, needs to be honest. Right? The, the one who generates uh, all the keys, right? he, he needs to do this properly and not give out the master secret key to anyone. And uh, so senders and receivers both can be dishonest, which is also where this is different from normal uh, encryption, that the sender also is supposed to be dishonest. And also, uh, here, what's, what's special is that the sanitizer 
can be kind of semi-honest, right? So we, yeah, as, as was said in the previous talk, the goal of AC is basically to minimize the trust in the sanitizer. Right? So we will explore basically what this means, how much uh, trust we still need. And so okay, let me just very briefly look at the original security definitions for, for ACE. So as was said before, also there are basically two kind of uh, rules, the no-read and the no-write rule. And uh, so this is the no-read rule, which essentially is like a CKA security. So what, what happens is that first keys are generated, and then the adversary can choose two messages and two uh, identities, and then uh, like a bit is randomly chosen, and depending on that bit, either the first message is encrypted for the first identity, or the second message is encrypted for the second identity, and then the adversary gets a ciphertext that needs to guess uh, what, what the bit was. Okay, and here the adversary basically has access to two oracles, the uh, keychain oracle that allows the adversary to get uh, sender or receiver keys, and there's also an encryption oracle uh, yeah, to, to get other ciphertexts, because basically if you use this, then maybe you see uh, other stuff that's going on. And essentially the winning condition is you need to guess the bit, but also we basically need to prevent the case that the, the adversary has access to a decryption key that allows to decrypt, because then, of course, uh, yeah, you can distinguish. So that's basically the, the privacy, and then there's also an anonymity. It's not so important, but this is kind of a stronger anonymity property that says even if you can decrypt, as long as the messages are equal, you cannot say which identity it was. Okay, so this, this is basically the, the no read rule and uh, the no write rule. Um, essentially, the, the intuition behind that is that an, an adversary cannot cook up some ciphertext that uh, can transmit some information to someone else who should not be allowed to decrypt. And this is formalized by saying the ciphertext cannot be distinguished from a fresh encryption of a random message. Right, so formally, there's again the setup, then the adversary chooses some ciphertext C0, which should contain some information, and there's an identity, and then either the C0 is sanitized and given to the adversary, or a fresh message is sampled, encrypted, sanitized, and this is again given to the adversary. Okay, so here, now the difference uh, to the uh, the no read rule is that here the adversary only has access to this oracle again OG, but here OES. So uh, there's no access to an encryption oracle. This ES uh, encrypts and then sanitizes the ciphertext. So basically, this can be justified by the fact that if you think about the application, then the repository only contains sanitized ciphertexts. Right? There's no, no unsanitized ciphertext in the repository. So yeah, maybe that, that's why also the, the adversary doesn't need to get access to an oracle that gives uh, unsanitized ciphertext. So. But, um, yeah, so if you think a bit about this, then, uh, so also there's a technical reason, because if you would give access to an encryption oracle, then one could easily win this game, right? Just basically, you could ask this uh, keychain oracle for a key that allows to decrypt, and then you could, uh, ask for some ciphertext that you can decrypt, and then this C0 could be this ciphertext, and then you could later uh, find out what this was. So yeah, it's a bit technical, the reading condition, but the, the, if, if you think about this, and if you know these definitions, then you see that you cannot just give access to the, to the encrypt oracle. So it seems to make sense, but if we um, now again think about the fact that we want to minimize trust in the sanitizer, then this might be problematic. And because if you look at this scenario again, there's one guy just sending some message. Now the sanitizer basically uh, knows the, the unsanitized ciphertext, of course. So what he could do is to just give this ciphertext to some bad guy. Or maybe it could also leak because this channel was not secure or for some other reason. Right? So it's not too hard in, in practice to think about a, a setting where this unsanitized ciphertext actually gets into the hands of some dishonest guy. Okay, what he could now do is he could try to massage the ciphertext somehow in a different ciphertext and then send this back to the sanitizer, who would then sanitize it and put it in the repository. So the question is now, how bad is this? So it's basically clear that this is not 
kind of uh, captured by the previous definition, the no write rule, because there was no encrypt. So there was no oracle basically that gives an, an attacker access to this, this uh, unsanitized cybertext. And so there's at least a definitional issue, but there's also an issue in the uh, existing schemes we looked at. So uh, both uh, the scheme um, by, by uh, Dankert et al. and also a follow-up work by Fuchsbauer uh, et al. They um, have a problem that the ciphertexts there are malleable, which basically allows you that if, if you're given such an unsanitized ciphertext and you know for which message the ciphertext is, you can produce valid uh, ciphertexts for arbitrary messages of your choice. Which means in practice, uh, once you have access to a single unsanitized ciphertext, the security is, is completely broken. You can from now on arbitrarily communicate in a policy uh, violating them. So this is actually a really bad. And um, yeah, so we try to fix that. And basically our idea is to introduce a new algorithm to the access control encryption, which we call a, a, a text modification. And uh, the basic idea is that you are given uh, two ciphertexts. And you can basically then decide whether the second ciphertext is a modification of the first ciphertext or whether it's just a fresh encryption. So what this precisely means is defined in the paper, but this is basically the, the rough intuition. And now if you have this magic function, then the sanitizer can just, uh, before sanitizing the, the ciphertext, check whether this is actually a fresh a ciphertext that you should sanitize or whether this is some malicious modification that you should reject. Okay, and if, if we do this, then we can also, in the security definition, give a access to this uh, encrypt oracle and basically just say, well, A does not win if this modification is detected. So this excludes the trivial attacks that you would get if you don't have this uh, demod error. Okay, so this is the the basic idea. And um, so there's a second issue with the, with the definition. Um, and this is basically that it does not consider chosen ciphertext attacks. And uh, they're actually also very natural if you think about the application. So as I said before, the, in the application it's inherent that the sender can be dishonest. Right? So we can have the setting where the, there is a dishonest guy who can send a ciphertext but then the ciphertext will be sanitized by the sanitizer, and now some uh, guy can decrypt this uh, sanitized ciphertext. But then this is uh, yeah, precisely what, what the chosen ciphertext attack looks like. You can uh, have some ciphertext that's cooked up in some way, and then uh, some guy will decrypt it. Right? So uh, yeah, basically, one should consider uh, this kind of attack by including an oracle that basically just does this which is first uh, sanitize and then decrypt. Okay, and this, yeah, we also do that by just um, yeah, defining this oracle that takes uh, ciphertext and uh, identity for which you want to decrypt and then sanitizes the ciphertext and decrypts. Right, and then basically in the definition, we give the, the adversary access to this oracle in, in all definitions basically and um, so for the no read, which now basically becomes, so before it was kind of a CPA uh, definition, now we kind of get a CCA, but here we can also relax this a bit because we have this uh, detect modification algorithm, um, which means, so in normal CCA security, we don't allow uh, to ask the challenge ciphertext to the decrypt oracle, and here we can also additionally exclude all ciphertexts that are detected as modifications of the challenge ciphertext because in the application they would also all be rejected by the sanitization. So you would never see uh, <coughs> the decryption of that. Okay, so this is the second uh, a way how we strengthen the definitions. There are actually more, uh, more things we do in the paper, but there's not, not enough time to discuss them all. Um, so let's, let's briefly uh, look at how we can construct a scheme that actually satisfies our stronger uh, definition. And essentially our construction uh, follows the overall structure of the construction by uh, Fuchsbauer et al. And um, so this is, we proceed, uh, proceed in three steps. The 
first step is we have um, what we call an enhanced uh, sanitizable public key encryption scheme, which is essentially a public key encryption scheme that is uh, anonymous and CCA secure and also sanitizable. So yeah, what this exactly means is also defined uh, more precisely in the paper, but intuitively we want to be able to re-randomize ciphertexts. So if you have a ciphertext, you can turn it into another ciphertext that looks like uh, completely fresh and you cannot link it to the original ciphertext. So there's also this concept of, of re-randomizable public key encryption, but um, so the, the thing is that this cannot be CCA secure, the re-randomizable thing, because uh, if you think about the CCA uh, game, if you get the challenge ciphertext, you could just re-randomize it, then give the re-randomized ciphertext to the decrypt oracle, and you could then uh, win the game. So to yeah, prevent this issue, basically the, the sanitizable version, a sanitized ciphertext, is different from the original one. So you cannot sanitize it twice. So there's a syntactical difference between ciphertext and sanitized ciphertext. Uh, but yeah. Again, as I said, for, for details, please, please look at the paper. And then if you have such, a, such an uh, SPKE scheme, then from this we can build an ACE scheme for the equality policy, which basically allows me to send messages to myself, or basically to everyone who has the same role. Right? And, um, so this, this step is, well, intuitively rather straightforward because this public key scheme already is something like this, right? If you generate a key pair, then you could say, okay, this the public key is just the encryption key for this role, and then the the, the, the the other key is the decryption key, right? And then you already have this, right? You can decrypt only if you have the key that matches the the, the one in that pair. So the, yeah, the only uh, difficulty is here that we have to to include the roles somehow. But there are roles in ACE which you don't have in, in public key encryption. So yeah, we essentially do this by just uh, yeah, generating the randomness depending on that role and using signatures. But this is uh, more or less straightforward. And then the, the last step is to basically lift this ACE scheme for the equality policy to more general policies. And yeah, so this is also um, I mean, essentially, the idea is there to just use many keys and encrypt the same message for, for different keys and then use some clever encodings. So this step is, is basically the same as in the scheme by Fuchsbauer et al. So I will here now uh, only explain the first step because that's kind of the, the most uh, interesting one. I think that's the, the one that requires new, new ideas. Okay, and so, so how does this work? So the first step what we do basically is we, we start with uh, essentially a gamma uh, scheme. <coughs> so we have some group uh, of generator G, and we have a uh, prime order, and then the, the public key is just uh, G to the X for some uniformly chosen X, and the decryption key is X. Now to encrypt the message, um, yeah, as I said, it's essentially like a gamma. We have some uniform uh, S, and then we multiply the message by g to the x, which is the public key to the power of s, and we also include g to the s. And to allow the sanitization, we have in addition some random r and uh, have g to the r and g to the xr, which we can also compute. And then to sanitize, what we do is we take basically the third ciphertext component and multiply it by the first one raised to the power of t, which is the first component of the sanitized ciphertext. And then the second component will be the second component of the original ciphertext to the power of t times the last uh, original uh, component. Yeah, and then to decrypt, you can basically just take the first component of the sanitized ciphertext, raise it to the power of x, which is the decryption key, invert this, and multiply it by the first component, and then you see everything except the message cancels out. So this scheme now is. Um, uh, anonymous, basically, so the, this X is uh, hidden from from the ciphertext if you cannot, uh, so if you assume DDH, and also it's sanitizable, so the sanitization, if you think about this, this T basically cancels out the other randomness, but this is not CCA secure, that's only CPA secure, so we need to make this 
CCA secure. So how do we do this? Basically, we use the, the now young uh, paradigm. Uh, that is, we encrypt the message twice using two independent keys, and then prove in zero knowledge that we did that. So we encrypted the same message uh, twice. Okay. So now there are several uh, technical issues in, in our case because <laughs> so the, the first thing is that normally the decrypt algorithm would verify the zero knowledge proof. But if you want to do this, then the sanitizer would also need to re-randomize the proof, right? because we want that uh, the sanitization basically completely uh, makes it impossible to link a ciphertext original one. So we would also need to, to re-randomize the proof, and this is kind of not so easy. So we chose the other option and say the sanitizer already can verify the, the proof. Um, and then only output the sanitized ciphertext if the proof is valid. Okay, but now this uh, again raises another issue because we want anonymity. So we don't want the sanitizer to know uh, what the keys were to produce the ciphertext. So this means that the public keys that we use for encryption cannot be part of the, of the ciphertext. So essentially what we do is we put these keys also in the witness of the uh, that, that we uh, verify in zero knowledge, and then uh, basically the sanitizer does not does not learn these keys. Uh, however, now we have the problem that we don't want an, an adversary to basically break up the connection between key pairs. Right? So we have so these two keys uh, keys here kind of belong together. They are uh, one one key pair. It should not be possible to now generate ciphertexts where you just change the second component, for example, to use a different key there. So we kind of need to bind these keys together. And we do this by essentially signing these key pairs and uh, yeah, so adding the signature. Uh, but again, now we have the problem. We cannot add the signature to the ciphertext itself because this would break anonymity. So we also verify the signature in zero knowledge. And then if you do all this, uh, yeah, you can basically see that, that this works out in the end. So yeah, this is the, the rough idea of our construction. So yeah, to, to sum it up, we have uh, new definitions for access control encryption that um, exclude the ciphertext revealing attacks, which is uh, how we call the attacks where uh, basically an attacker gets access to an unsanitized ciphertext. And uh, we also include uh, chosen ciphertext attacks. And we have uh, additional uh, yeah, strengthenings that I didn't have time to discuss here, and we have a new scheme for our stronger definition. And so there are many uh, problems left also. So yeah, our scheme is not particularly efficient, which is essentially uh, mostly because of the zero knowledge, which so we need the simulation sound zero knowledge in a general setting, which is not super efficient in practice, so it would be nice to do this in a more efficient way, and also to have schemes for more general policies, as in the previous talk. So also interesting. And finally, uh, it would be nice to, to understand what are the real limitations of access control encryption, in which settings can you actually use it, and or maybe do you need even stronger definitions than the ones we had. Thank you. Questions? We have time for questions again. Yes, sure. Funny you should mention the use cases. Do you have any intuition as to what would be the prime use case for AC in general? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, I mean, basically, uh, I mean, so the most natural use case would be to use this in, in some company, maybe where there's some access control policy, you have some, I don't know, some parties uh, have access to some medical information, for example, and they should not be allowed to send this to other parties, so you could uh, kind of use this. Um, but I mean, one question that arises here is basically who is the sanitizer and, and why, I mean, how much do you trust him? Kind of this, this in practice is maybe not so clear. And so in the original paper, this was motivated by you could uh, basically have like outsourced everything. So you don't want to store all your data and the sanitizer locally, but you outsource this to the cloud or to some other company and then they do all the sanitization. So this could be one, one use case that you have very sensitive data that is stored elsewhere and you don't, don't, you want to control who, who can send information to who. Yeah. 
further questions or comments? The floor and that's my question again.